key concept here. Mercy is only free to be displayed, can be shown once justice and holiness are satisfied. Okay? Now, we haven't used it in scriptures here, but do you understand what we're talking about? God can only express mercy, saving mercy, to a, um, to a sinner, to remit their sins, to forgive them, to save them, if he is able to be merciful. God will only continually forgive a Christian if he's free to do so, and of course he is free to do so, the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the propitiatory sacrifice, continues to cleanse us. So God's free. This concept of propitiation in its relationship to mercy is best seen in Hebrews chapter 9. Please turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 9. I think um, Yeah, I there is a word that is translated uh, is translated from the um, before we read that I want to I, I, I left out something in my teaching process here we started with the definition I hope you see the concepts okay what I wanted you to see is the relationship of the components of the concepts right but I can't show you that until we get the Greek words clear in our minds what is what is the Greek word for propitiation or propitious do you remember Hell last te rion. Right? And I think there's another one, isn't there? Yes, Hilas Mas. Which one? Hilas Mas is a first John two two and it's translated propitiation. Look up 1 John 4.10, Blair. Okay, so 1 John 4.10 is the same word. <coughs> Propitiation, translate the same way. Now, um, look up Romans 3.25. Being justified freely through, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a, propiti a propitiation. Romans 3.25. Hilasterion. And this is Romans 3.25. And it's translated. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. It's, it's translated by the same English word. I want you to see this. But you know what it is? It's not a noun. It's an adjective. Right? This is the noun form, hilasmos. This is an adjective, hilasterion. Literally, it means, it, if you were going to do it consistently, it, would, it should be translated a propitiatory something. And then it's an example in the Greek of ellipsis where the noun is left out and the adjective is translated as a noun. Right? Um, so it's translated as if it was the same word, but it's not. 
Okay? This is the noun propitiation. This is an adjective that means propitiatory. So Romans 3.25 could be translated this way. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiatory something to declare his righteousness, etc., etc. Well, what would you put in there? A propitiatory sacrifice. You know, there's no reason why you couldn't supply the word sacrifice because that's exactly what Christ was. Well, it's better off. You're better off to do it that way. It makes it clear to understand. All right? Now, now we want to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5. And if you would look that up, Blair, there's another word, I think, that's sort of related to the subject of propitiation. Uh, I think it's Hebrews 9, 5. <coughs> Pardon? Mm-hmm. Don't see that word. No, I, I don't need. Pardon? He was talking about the word hilasterion. Okay, so this word is found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5. Let's read that verse together. Uh, maybe we should start reading at the beginning of the sentence, verse 3. <coughs> And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, in which was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it, that is, over the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim of glory shadowing the propitiatory something. See, that's an adjective there. They've translated a mercy seat overshadowing the propitiatory something of which we cannot now speak particularly. We supplied the word sacrifice in Romans 5, Romans 3.25, because it fits. Jesus Christ is a sacrifice, and of course, it, it, it just makes sense, right? That's consistent with what the rest of scriptures declare him to be. He is the Lamb of God. He is the sacrifice. He is a propitiatory. If you wanted to supply lamb, that would be probably even better. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiatory lamb. A, a, a satisfying lamb sacrifice. All right? What word are you going to supply for the word mercy seat? You know, just to get rid of this word mercy seat for the moment. To make a connection to propitiation. It's the same word, hilasterion. So, let's let's describe it as uh, I'm running out of space here. Romans 3:25 would be uh, propitiatory lamb or sacrifice. Okay, um, Hebrews 9:5. If we used it as an adjective again, propitiatory something. Is it talking about a sacrifice here? Here's, here's the Ark of the Covenant. Here's a diagram. Okay, there was a box. It had handles. You know, wooden handles that stuck out uh, from rings on each corner. And it had an angel figurine on each side. And right here, between the angelic figures, read that, read that sentence again to yourself. <clears throat> what word would you put in there? What noun would you supply? Is it talking about a person? 
It's talking about a place. So why not put that word in there? Isn't that what the mercy seat is? Isn't it the place of propitiation? Wasn't it the place where God was satisfied? Wasn't it the place that when God was satisfied that it became the mercy seat? The place where mercy was dispensed from? The place. The location, if you will. The propitiatory location. The propitiatory place. Does that help you understand it? If we're not trying to make it complex, I'm trying to help you to see that if we're going to be consistent in the translation of our words, then here's the connection between the Old and New Testament. This word is used of the person of Christ as a, as a satisfying sacrifice. The very adjective is described of the person of Christ. And yet, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, going back to Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, this is describing a place at, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant that was known in the Old Testament as the mercy seat, as the place from which mercy was dispensed. In essence, it's the propitiation place. It's the place of propitiation, the place of satisfaction. And how was this satisfaction accomplished back in the Old Testament? Once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil with blood and put it on the mercy seat. He would put a drop of blood on the mercy seat. And only with the with the placing of the blood once a year on the Day of Atonement, would God then become propitious towards his people, merciful. If he didn't get the blood, then his people were out of fellowship. He would cut them off. He was not satisfied. And that happened, right? For years they lost the Ark of the Covenant to their enemies. And they were under judgment. And God was not blessing his people. And so... The mercy seat concept shows us this aspect of our definition here. Because the Old Testament so graphically pictured that when God was satisfied with blood, then mercy was dispensed from the Ark of the Covenant. Mercy seat. I think that's an essential ingredient in the definition. That propitiation was Christ's work in satisfying God's justice and holiness by his substitutionary death by his sacrificial death, which resulted in the possible display of mercy from God to people. This is something that was God-directed, and when God, when, it, when God was satisfied, then it made everything else possible. It was like the turning of the key in the door. You satisfy God, then God can shower forth his mercy, displayed in uh, all these other acts of salvation. Okay? We'll continue on with this one next class because we're not near finished with it. Do you think he knew it was like to dwell among men? Yes, but God certainly knows. You know, I mean, you, omniscience requires that he knows everything about us. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He sees a sparrow fall. You know, the omniscience of God requires that, you know, so it's not like it is for us. If, if I actually added to myself Martian flesh, to use an absurd example, but something of a sin, kinful nature, you know, I'm human, but then I add myself some kind of flesh that's totally different, right? As long as I remain the same as I am here, you know, then in one sense you can say I haven't changed. Right? Um, and that's what's true about the person of Christ. That's not a very good example. Well, he, even though he took the upon himself to come to flesh, it in no way caused the to stumble upon. Right. And even the flesh was sinless. It was in perfect harmony with his deity. You know, he was sinless before he became a man, and he was certainly sinless after he became a man. The humanity that Jesus Christ possessed in no way um, contradicted his essential divine qualities. Right? 
that was just different in character, right? The, the, his deity was infinite, his humanity was finite. By its very nature, humanity is finite. It, it, when they try to make the argument, humanity, they're trying to prove it's lesser than right? right. Well, But he possessed both. That's what this says. And the word uh, became, came into being, flesh, and dwelt among us. Right? So this is the great mystery. It's an inexplicable thing. You have a hypostatic union. Two natures standing side by side, neither changed from its essential qualities or less than what others of the same nature possessed. The Father possesses full deity, the Spirit possesses full deity, the Word possesses full deity. Human beings possess full humanity. And so it was equal in their respect. And uh, you have to depend upon uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, and Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, and other references like that to explain this phrase, the Word became flesh. So, John is simply establishing the fact of Jesus' dual nature. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. One more comment on this before I leave it, and that is uh, when it says that the Word was made flesh. Flesh, for us, has a negative connotation, right? It means body plus depraved nature, right? Galatians chapter 5, Paul says in verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do what you would or you should. Right? The way Paul uses the word flesh sometimes refers to, you know, is defined by context as referring to our sinful nature. Did Jesus Christ possess sinful nature? You have to go to the scriptures to find out what kind of flesh Jesus possessed. And that's the great significance of the Hebrew 4, 15 and 16. He was like, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Hebrews 7.25, Jesus Christ did not need to offer up sacrifices for himself first and also for the sins of others and then for the sins of others like other priests. All right? So the flesh of Jesus Christ. I think there's a reference in Romans chapter 8 to this as well. It just crossed my mind. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus Christ was flesh, but it was only a likeness to sinful flesh. It wasn't synonymous with sinful flesh. See? Eight, three. That's a key, key reference. The word became flesh. Yes, it was flesh, all right. It was true humanity, but it wasn't exactly the same as your flesh, because yours is sinful flesh, <laughs> all right? Subject to different laws. And then in John chapter 1, it says that he dwelt among us, and dwelt among us. The Greek verb implies temporary dwelling. This, is, this precise dual nature, uh, or at least the manifestation of it, was only temporary. The word is made flesh and dwelt among us. So was made uh, refers to, implies an act, and dwelt among us implies a um, continuous existence in the past. Right? Temporary. The, the verb itself means uh, as we'll see in a moment, the same verb is used twice in this verse. Um, no, I guess it isn't. It's just used once. But the word dwell means to have one's tabernacle, to go tenting. You know, it's like you go camping. When you go camping, your tent is not a permanent fixture. It's a temporary dwelling place. And that's the precise word that Paul uses, or John uses, for the body of Jesus Christ is a temporary thing. All right? that lasted for 30-some years. Right? And uh, that is very much in the same manner in which the Apostle Paul uses, refers to our bodies in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that if the tabernacle of this body is, uh, 
this tabernacle was destroyed, I forget how he puts it, you know, but he talks about our bodies as being a tent as well. Temporary. Right? So this is the fact of Jesus' dual nature, and then John uh, presents the manifestations, or stresses the manifestations of Jesus' dual nature. He dwelt among us. Uh, stressing that uh, temporary dwelling, the same word is used in Revelation 7:15. 12, 12, 13, 6, 21, 3. All of the gospel accounts record Jesus' temporary life on earth for approximately 30 years. So do secular historians. Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny. Roman and Jewish historians refer to the um, temporary existence of the Lord Jesus Christ in time. Testimonial evidence at a personal level John himself. Now, I'd like to ask you a question about this. When it says, And we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What do you think John is referring to? Who's the we in the first place? The disciples. Okay, that's one view. But the twelve disciples were privileged to actually see God in the flesh, like no others. I mean, the masses of people did see him occasionally, but these men lived with Jesus for three and a half years. They really saw, and the word beheld in the Greek, there are many, there are dozens of words that have the general idea to look at in Greek. This particular word is um, a verb that implies a careful and deliberate study and observation. Therefore, this implies that Jesus' nature was by no means just an illusion or hallucination like some people have suggested in early church history. You, you've been taking church history. In the first two or three centuries, there was a great deal of discussion as to the nature of the person of Jesus Christ. You know, were the two natures fused? Was, was he only flesh and he appeared to be God? Or was he God and he appeared to be flesh and he really wasn't a man, he was just a spirit? Right? These are the various possibilities, uh, logically, of describing such a person. Well, the fact that John could actually look and behold seriously with others the person of Jesus Christ shows that it wasn't just a, a fleeting hallucination. Regularly, Jesus manifested this duality of his character. I would like to suggest that in this verse we have a, an allusion to one specific event out of the gospel accounts. Think of it. We beheld, John says, his glory. Shekinah glory, yes. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I, I think that it's very probable that John is alluding to one of the most dramatic events in his experience with Jesus. Recorded in Matthew 17 and other places where Jesus was transfigured before them, that he actually manifested on this one or two occasions the Shekinah glory that he actually possessed. And he only did it with which disciples? James, Peter, James, and John. The intimate three, the clo three closest, the inner circle. And John was possessed of that. Uh, he, he was privileged to see that. Who else saw it? Peter and James. You know what? You can go to James and you can you can find an allusion to the very same event. You can go to First Peter and you can find an allusion to this very same event. Second Peter, actually, right? It's very interesting that this this uh, transfiguration was uh, a highlight in the experience of these disciples, and they John alludes to it here, I believe. But there's 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 no better example of the dual nature of Jesus Christ in John's experience than that event. Jesus walked up this man. He was probably puffing by the time he came to the top of the hill. And all of a sudden, kapow, whoosh! And they fell down like dead men. You know, you can just picture it. Uh, when it says, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, um, it's Jesus' glory. It's limited to Jesus, but it's the Father's glory. Say that? His glory, we beheld His glory, Jesus' glory. Jesus was possessed of it. It was His own. But at the same time, it was really the Father's. <coughs> and uh, next class, hopefully, we'll pick up with this discussion of full of grace and truth because that's uh, very pregnant with meet meaning.
that phrase.